Hello, it's Scott Manley here. The Soyuz rocket has been flying for almost 70 years. It's based on the R-7 Intercontinental Ballistic Missile System developed by Sergei Karelyev. The core stage and the boosters is basically the same rocket that launched Sputnik into orbit. So not only did this design start the space race, but it survived the breakup of Soviet Russia and will continue to fly for many years to come. Similarly, the Proton rocket is also a Soviet-era artifact which continues to fly, and these are the two main rockets that Russia flies. But these rockets are by no means the only rockets that were developed by the Soviet Union. These are the ones that have survived. A couple of obvious examples are the N1, which was a Soviet moon rocket. It never made it to orbit and was quietly killed before it became too embarrassing. There was the Energia rocket, which was used to launch the Buran shuttle. And that mainly didn't survive because the Soviet Union was running out of money and couldn't afford to sustain the program. But there were a number of more modest launch vehicles developed starting in the 1960s, which are no longer used by Russia, primarily because they were largely Ukrainian. In the development of the R-7 rocket, there were two major personalities that mattered. There was Sergei Karaliev, the chief designer, and Valentin Glushko, who designed the engines. And there were a number of things they did not agree on. In particular, Glushko wanted to use hypergolic propellants because he believed that that was the best way to build you know, rockets that were used in military systems. Karaliev did not want the highly toxic propellants that were needed for these to be used on rockets with humans on board. So Glushko's design bureau, OKB456, began to develop engines which uh, used these propellants. Meanwhile, another associate of uh, Karelyev, a guy called Mikhail Gryangel, uh, set up his own design bureau in Ukraine, in Dnepropetrovsk. And so this design bureau, which is based in what is now Bu Ukraine, uh, developed some of the most important uh, missiles for the Soviet missile forces, the R-12, the R-14, the R-16, the R-36, and these were also converted into launch vehicles. So I want to talk about these other Soviet launch vehicles. So first on our list is the Cosmos rocket, and this was originally derived from the R-12 Dvina ballistic missile. That's also known as the SS-4 uh, Sandal in the West. So that's like a 42-ton single-stage hypergolically fueled missile, and that could launch a 1.6-ton warhead up to 5,000 kilometers. The engine on this was the RD-214 that has four combustion chambers burning nitric acid and nitrogen tetroxide. The pump on this has to be powered by a separate supply of hydrogen peroxide, which it decomposes to generate steam. And this had been developed by, of course, Glushko over at OKB-456. So the R-12 was the first practical long-range ballistic missile, primarily because it didn't need those cryogenic propellants. The R-12 was also the missile at the heart of the Cuban Missile Crisis. To turn it into the Cosmos launch vehicle, it needed a second stage. So they added an RD-119 burning UDMH with liquid oxygen, which is a rare uh, combination. And that new second stage added about 8.5 tonnes, and this enabled payloads of up to 350 kilograms to be delivered to orbit from the launch site that was used at Kapustin Yar. After a couple of launch failures, the first successful launch of Cosmos in 1961 carried the satellite Cosmos 1. Now, as you probably know, Cosmos is the sort of generic name given to satellites that the Soviet Union and later Russia launched that they didn't want to go into too much detail about. There has been over 2,500 Cosmos satellites since this Cosmos 1. But it does make me wonder whether the name of the rocket was Cosmos before it launched the satellite, because it's quite common for Soviet rockets to take on the name of the first satellite they launched, or at least the one they're associated with. For example, Proton and Soyuz. By 1964, they've clearly made some improvements because it now takes on the name Cosmos 2, but on paper, there's not much difference between them. Uh, but between the two of the rockets, between 1961 and uh, 1973, they launched 75 payloads. But there was another version of the Cosmos based on the R-14 missile, also known as the SS-5 Skeen. So the R-14 is about twice the mass of the R-12. It's got a more powerful RD-216 engine. 
They add a second stage to this, and now it's burning UDMH and nitrogen tetroxide, and it uses an engine called the S5.23. So the total launch mass of this vehicle is 110 tons, and that's able to put 1.25 tons into low Earth orbit. So it initially appears in 1964, and then it's known as the Cosmos 3. And then in 1975, they introduce an improved version, the Cosmos 3M, but apparently the main difference is the second stage now has more uh, capable maneuvering so it can put the stuff into you know more accurate satellite orbits and this version flies over 400 times it flies right up until about 2010 notably it would be a cosmos 3m rocket which launched aryabhatta india's first satellite so moving onwards the next rocket on our list is the cyclone and this was based on the R-36 missile, and that's a two-stage monster ICBM with MIRV capabilities. In the West, this was famously known, or infamously known, as the SS-18, or Satan. So the R-36 also came out of Yangle's design bureau. It was a 180-ton missile, 3 meters in diameter, 36 meters tall. The first stage was powered by three dual chambered rd 1250 engine so that means six nozzles all burning udmh and nitrogen tetroxide this gave it 240 tons of thrust steering was through an rd 68m which had produced like four vernier thrusters around the perimeter uh, the 123 ton first stage would operate for the first two minutes of flight then the second stage it also burned udmh nitrogen tetroxide the engine was the RD-252, which was a vacuum-optimized version of the first stage engine. Uh, it still used two nozzles and a single set of turbo pumps, and that got about 100 tons of thrust. And again, steering would use a set of vernier thrusters. So as a missile, it could put some very hefty warheads on target anywhere in the Earth. But as a rocket, without any changes, it could put 3.2 tons into low Earth orbit. So in this form, it would be known as the Cyclone II. First launch was in 1965, and it would operate until 2006, with a total of 133 launches. And so in 1977, we get a new version, the Cyclone 3. This adds a 5-ton upper stage, and this has like an RD-861 engine and Vernier thrusters. And what this does is it increases the mass to orbit to 3.6 tons, but more importantly, this engine can be relit once it's in orbit. And so that massively increases the versatility for what final orbits they can insert into. And the Cyclone 3 would continue to launch after the breakup of the Soviet Union right up until 2009 with a total of 119 launches. And it was very much a Ukrainian rocket, albeit built with uh, many Russian components, in particular the engines. Now, there had been plans for a Cyclone 4 with many improvements. It had a larger third stage and fairing, it had modern avionics, and you could relight the upper stage engine multiple times. This was developed in partnership with Brazil with an eye of launching into geostationary orbits from Alcantara. But the project stalled and Brazil pulled out over financial concerns. Similarly, they began developing the 4M version, and this was another update which was to operate from a spaceport in Nova Scotia. This switched to a kerosene and liquid oxygen first stage. It dropped the third stage, but for obvious reasons, this project is also suspended. Our next rocket is the Zenit, and again, this is developed by OKB586, which was Yangle's uh, design bureau. And originally, this was conceived as a medium-lift launch vehicle to carry things like Soyuz and other similarly class payloads. It was never a missile. It was never intended to be a weapon. It uses cryogenic propellants. So that rocket is about 60 meters tall, 3.9 meters in diameter, and it masses about 450 tons. The booster was the first launch vehicle to use the famous RD-171 staged combustion engines on that 350 ton first stage. The second stage is 90 tons, it has an RD-120, and in this form, the Zenit could deliver 13.5 tons to low Earth orbit, and this made it a much more capable launch vehicle than the Soyuz, and about half as capable as the more expensive Proton. So this would be called the Zenit 2, and it began launching in 1985, and it continued for 37 launches until 2007. 
Many of these launches were paid for by Russia, who had Soviet-era payloads which were too big for Soyuz, too small for Proton. They needed those Zenit capabilities. But Russia was understandably reluctant to put its prime payloads on what is now a Ukrainian rocket. Uh, Zenit did carry the Phobos Grunt mission into its parking orbit in 2011, and this was of course supposed to be the largest interplanetary space probe ever launched, if only the software had actually worked and it hadn't burned up instead. Now, Zenit 3 added a 20-ton third stage. Again, this would burn uh, kerosene and liquid oxygen. It would use uh, the RD-58 engine. And this was needed because they were going to put payloads into geostationary orbit as a part of sea launch. They actually had the capability of doing direct insertion into geostationary orbit. So Sea Launch was a collaboration between Ukraine, Russia, and Boeing. And it launched a number of satellites from a platform in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So because this was from a platform, they could actually move this right onto the equator to give them zero launch inclination. And this enabled the satellites to reach their ultimate orbit with the maximum amount of spare propellant and therefore extend the satellite's life. There would be a total of 42 launches from Sea Launch's Odyssey platform. Finally, there was the Zenit 3F, which used a Russian frigate as a third stage, and this enabled geostationary launches from uh, Baikonur. It only launched four times, including the final launch of a Zenit rocket in 2017, carrying Angosat-1 into geostationary orbit. And another part of the Zenit that we have to mention was that it was also designed as the first stage booster for the Soviet Energia rocket. So there would be four Zenit first stage boosters strapped around the Energia core. Energia would only fly twice because the breakup of the Soviet Union robbed the space program of funds. But I think also the breakup of the Soviet Union actually saved Soyuz, which was aging technology even in the early 1990s. By every objective metric, Zenit was a far superior rocket to Soyuz and would have likely replaced it. But since it wasn't being built in Russia, and Russia couldn't afford to design a replacement, they kept the Soyuz alive. So all those launch vehicles were developed when Ukraine and Russia were part of the Soviet Union. But since the breakup, there have been a few more vehicles that have been developed that were derived from Soviet technology. And they started pretty soon after the breakup. First of all, there was the START rocket. And this actually gets its name from the Arms Reduction Treaty that led to the missile being retired from service. The START-1 is derived from the RT-2PM Topol ICBM. The first three stages of the Topol missile are basically used as the first three uh, stages of the START-1. They're essentially unmodified for their new purpose, but they add a fourth stage that takes the place of the warhead. That it has another solid rocket motor on board, and that enables them to put about 500 kilograms into orbit. Now, this was designed as a mobile missile. So this is a truck that could drive anywhere and in theory launch from there. It launched a total of seven times from 1993 to 2006, with one of those launches failing. Another post-Soviet rocket design is called Rocket, as in R-O-K-O-T, right? So it's based on a decommissioned UR-100 missile that's also known as the SS-19. And the UR-100 is kind of like the baby of the Proton. It had, they added a Breeze third stage for orbital insertion, and this made a 110-ton rocket that could lob 1.85 tons into low Earth orbit. And this was offered as a launch vehicle in the West, and it flew a bunch of interesting payloads, including like Iridium satellites and the GRACE experiment, which used a pair of satellites traveling close together to measure gravitational field of the Earth in extreme detail. And then there's the Still one which is a submarine-launched ballistic missile which was converted into an orbital launch vehicle, so therefore setting records for the lowest launch site, I would imagine. So, yes, an R-29RM submarine-launched ballistic missile, they actually launched it from a submarine, and it put some small payloads into orbit once in 1998 and again in 2006, but this was not a long-lasting launch vehicle. But the post-Soviet launch vehicle that has had arguably the biggest effect on spaceflight has to be the Dnieper. And again, this is based on the R-36 missile, albeit a newer, more capable version of it. This was a missile that could deliver 
up to 10 1 megaton warheads to different targets because after the first two stages burned out, the warhead platform could had its own propulsion so it could maneuver and deposit the warheads onto different targets. And this could be used for orbital insertion. But there was one little interesting niggle about this because the way it was designed, the thrusters pointed forwards. And that meant to get the best performance out of the Dnieper, the third stage would be detached. It would then have to rotate 180 degrees and then start firing its engines to continue the insertion into orbit. Since it was derived from a missile, it also had an interesting launch process. It would be ejected from a tube by a piston and then light its main engines as it began to fall back towards the uh, surface. So Dnieper could put uh, about 4.5 tons into low Earth orbit. It was marketed as a low-cost launch vehicle in a collaboration between Ukraine and Russia. And they got a bunch of customers. The first launch was in 1999, and in total there would be 22 launches. Twice it actually held the record for the most payloads carried into orbit. So it launched 14 payloads in uh, like 2007, and that would be a record until 2013 when a Minotaur 1, also a decommissioned uh, you know, missile, uh, placed 29 satellites into orbit. Then Dnieper got the record back soon after, putting 32 satellites into orbit. And that would hold the record until 2014 when Antares launched 34. And at this point, I feel I need to remind you that the first stage of Antares is also built by Ukraine and it was based upon the Zenit rocket. But given this was essentially a collaboration between Russia and Ukraine, it couldn't last. And the final uh, Dnieper launch was in 2015. But Dnieper ended up playing a pivotal role for a payload that it didn't launch. Because back in 2001, this guy called Elon Musk has a whole bunch of money and he wants to send greenhouses to Mars. He travels to Russia. He talks with them about putting spacecraft on rockets. And they end up jerking him around, trying to get more money out of him than he had. And so he gives up, goes home empty-handed. And while he's flying home, he says to Jim Cantrell, who he was with, you know... I think we could build our own rockets. And you'll never guess what happened next. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.